Good evening, everyone. I want to thank you for joining us for this event. Um, we are still getting back into our in-person events for SOD Talks, um, and I'm very excited for that. Um, uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Denise Naku. I'm the director of the School of Design and the Jarvis College of Computing and Digital Media. And um, I'm very excited for our first SOD Talks event for the year. Um, and we plan to have uh, several more throughout uh, the rest of the academic year. Uh, the best way to keep in touch with us is if you check out our Eventbrite and our um, Instagram and, uh, and get, in, get, uh, get in touch with us that, that way. And we'll share the links for those of you who are um, in Zoom. Uh, welcome as well. I'm very glad that you were able to join us um, and uh, we'll send those links out to you all. Um, and today, uh, our first speaker of the year uh, of the year is Dana Ware. Um, and um, I'm very excited that she's traveled here uh, to to kind of kick everything off. And uh, to introduce our special guest, uh, we have our um, faculty member in game design, Leanne Tran. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Denise. Uh, so yes, I'm Leanne Tran, professor in the School of Design and Games, Interactive Experiences for Social Impact, Social Justice. And I am very excited to welcome Dana here to DePaul um, in here to Chicago, visiting from Salt Lake City in Utah. Um, and I will give a quick intro and would love to also, you know, this is, we're hoping to, you know, make the most of this for you all. So um, Dana will take it away, but also feel free to interact with us uh, throughout the, the session. But yeah, so Dana Ware is an international award-winning Chicana director who specializes in virtual reality and augmented reality. She has an undergraduate degree from UCLA in interdisciplinary art and film, a master's degree in entertainment arts and engineering and game development, as well as an MFA in film and, media, and new media, both from the University of Utah. In 2019, Dana became a creative director at The Void, where she helped to explore the future of VR storytelling and directing. And Dana's work includes a hyper-reality TV series, at-home VR experiences, location-based experience uh, experiences uh, for virtual reality, simulator rides, and augmented reality projects. Specializes in developing innovative and magical experiences by combining virtual and physical realities into hyper-reality. Uh, Dana is an ambassador for women in games, and she also serves as a VRDC summit advisor for GDC. So um, that's a virtual reality uh, related summit um, for a game developers conference uh, where she helps to advance the VR and AR industry. And on that note for GDC, I will say if you ever needed evidence for why you should network or every, any opportunity could be not a networking opportunity. Dana and I met in the crepe line at GDC in March of this year and we became instant friends. Um, we clearly kept in touch. Um, I'm very excited to have her here. And um, truly, like people are always there to just get to know you and share their experiences and connect. And so I hope that this is one of those moments for all of you. Hi, my name is Dina Ware. I'm really excited to be here with you today. And I'm really grateful for this opportunity uh, to speak with you about something that I am incredibly passionate about, VR and AR. So if, the way we're going to kind of format this, though, is a little bit more of a casual presentation in the sense that if you have questions at all, feel free to ask. I can stop, pause, you know, we'll, we'll kind of pause in certain breaks of the presentation anyways, just because there's some natural pauses. So please do ask questions. I know that sometimes the terminology that's used or some of these emerging tech spaces um, can be a little confusing or there might be some questions that pop up feel free to ask them. I'm, I'm really happy to explain or go into detail about anything that you guys are interested in because this talk is really for you. Oh, is it gonna work? Perfect. I see. Okay, well, I'll see if it works on the next slide. So um, as you heard in my intro, I, am, I went to UCLA, I'm actually from from at Los Angeles, so I'm a native to Los Angeles. So I grew up in the entertainment mecca, right? Tons of entertainment around me, tons of different things kind of happening. So I did film for many, many years in Los Angeles and then also in Salt Lake 
when I moved to Utah, I was doing film. Um, and I was exposed to virtual reality at Sundance Film Festival. It was the first year that they had it there and it blew my mind. I was like, this is amazing. I have to do this more. I want to get more involved and, and learn how to bring interactive experiences to people. I've been doing some museum installation work in Los Angeles. That's kind of part of my, my undergrad study. I did museum gallery kind of installation pieces and continued that on professionally as well. But it really means that this is, this is a industry that can build on almost any type of foundation that you bring to it. So I just want to make that really clear. I, I was a film person, right? I was doing a lot of traditional film, photography, museum stuff, but I wasn't doing game development specifically until I was mesmerized by virtual reality and decided, you know what, I really want to figure out how to get an education in this so that I'm more skilled in a variety of ways. And bring that film and fine art education that I had and kind of build on that, right? Just keep building upon it. So I decided to go get two master's degrees, one of them specifically in game development in, in engineering school. So you go from art to engineering and that kind of sounds weird, but it was the way that I could actually build this. I kind of curated my own education by getting the two master's degrees, right? The other one in film and new media. But it was a way to be able to bring all of these skills and these different types of platforms together to really create the thing that I wanted to make. And um, I was very fortunate because people kind of just let me do my thing. Um, so it was pretty exciting to be able to do that. Now I'm going to need to answer some of Working for you. Okay, great. So over the years, like I said, I worked in traditional media as well. Um, so anything that is on a, the black background over on this side is a company that I worked in a traditional format, whether that's film or photography, museum stuff. And anything that's on the white background are companies where I've done things that are emerging tech. So AR, VR specifically is more of the stuff on the white background. Um, as was said, I am a uh, summit advisor for GDC. If you've never been to the Game Developers Conference, I highly encourage that you attend because it's an opportunity to not just network and meet people in random chance opportunities like a creep line, but you can also go to tons of sessions where you're learning and engaging with the community. It's really going to open your mind to like what's out there, the different companies that are recruiting to, and opportunities to get your portfolio to kind of to be reviewed as well, or, or watch other people have their portfolios reviewed so you know how to build yours as well. So really great opportunities there. If you're ever thinking about submitting a talk or want to get involved, please reach out to me because I'm really excited to have people participate in GDC. It's really um, something that's special to me and I love what it does for the community. These are all the different organizations I've spoken at, so lots of different conferences. Some of them are game specific, but some of them are not. So IAPA, for example, is not necessarily a games conference. It's a themed entertainment conference. So it's actually a theme park conference, which is kind of fun because I like to go hang out at theme parks. And um, growing up in LA, Disneyland, Universal Studios, Six Flags, love theme parks. And so I actually love making themed entertainment, which you'll see as we go through more of the presentation. So I am an ambassador for Women in Games. It's an organization that if you can get involved with, want to get involved with, they're doing a lot of great work. They have a lot of free kind of content on their website. So they try to get people really involved and it's an international organization, which is great. Um, the IGDA is another international organization. If you are a student, I highly encourage you to get involved. If you're a professional, please get involved. Um, I am in, I'm one of the leaders over the Women in Games SIG, so special interest group of the IGDA. So we do a lot of good. We try to reach out and help people um, to kind of connect with each other and network and build this community as well. And I'm also an advisor for the AIXR consumer entertainment section of the AI, AIXR organization, uh, which means that we are trying to help kind of build standards for the industry and give people kind of a foundation as to where things are heading and kind of projections for the industry as well. Um, so my most recent project that's released 
is the Transformers project that's at Dave and Buster's. It's a, it's a fun simulator experience. So you actually sit inside of the simulator, you put on a VR headset, and you get to fight alongside the Autobots. So it's really fun. Optimus Prime picks you up and holds you. You get this intimate moment with him. It's really fun. Um, so this is actually one of my projects that's probably the most easiest to access at the moment that's open and uh, available for the public. So if you have a chance, please go to Dave & Buster's, try it out. It's a fun experience. I'm actually going to use this experience a little bit later in the presentation for contextual kind of purposes as well. So this is a trailer for it. So um, that was a project that wasn't associated with my current role. That's a different project, not with The Void. I am currently the creative director of The Void. Uh, we are a location-based um, hyper-reality entertainment provider. Um, we create hyper-reality, it's our specialty. And I'll kind of explain to you what that is because it is, yeah, you can go to the next one. These are the different IPs that we have built an experience with and for. Um, so very specialized within working with studios, Sony, Disney, we have our original IP as well. But we create magical experiences for people. So they get to go in and actually be a part of these worlds that they know and love. And it's really great to see how much people connect with the content, but actually are blown away because of the immersiveness of this content. So they get to actually feel as though they were with Spider-Man. And sometimes I've seen them come out in tears because they got to be with their heroes, which is really, really special to us. This is a trailer for the Avengers. The powerful threat has resurfaced. I sense that this force has been waiting rebuilding its strength in secret until now. Are you guys the new recruits? You will fail to see the big picture. But no turning back now. Strange sent us. We're your backup. Oh, that wizard glow circled right into the middle of our date. Scott, popcorn on the couch and reruns of Golden Girls is not a date. Stop calling it a date. Heads up, everybody. More coming! Make good choices! So, if you were to look at a couple of the scenes within that trailer, you would have noticed that there is some gear that the people are wearing, right? So they have a haptic vest on them, there's a headset on them, and they're physically going into a space that is virtually mapped out one-to-one -one relation. You go in with your friends, so it's actually a very collaborative experience, or your co-op playing in this, and you're moving through that virtual space, but physically as well. So you can touch the walls, there's different props, you're using different mechanics, um, as part of that experience. So it's a fully immersive experience um, that we really deliver. And this is what we specialize in. Bungie is in grave danger. Relying on you to lift the curse.
So again, we are dropping you and your friends into the jungles of Jumanji. And you have a mission. There's things that you're going to have to do. You're going to have to work together. Everyone has different abilities and skills. And it's just really this amazing experience to watch people get frightened by that crocodile. They see the crocodile and they think that is a real crocodile that's about to eat them. And they will freak out because of that crocodile. So really fun opportunities to kind of play with that perspective that people have within the virtual setting. So tonight we're gonna to be talking about blurring the lines between emerging tech and traditional game development. Um, I know a lot of you in here are studying traditional game development as well. Some people are specializing in VR here. Um, some people are you know, film specific individuals. So please ask questions as we go through this. If you have any, um, I would love to clarify anything that I might be saying and uh, yeah. So these, you know, when we're talking about emerging tech, these are really kind of the broad overviews of, of different types of things that we're seeing today. I'm going to mostly focus on virtual reality, augmented reality. Um, virtual production is something that I do have a background in. So if you guys want me to kind of go into any specifics on that, I can. But thinking about virtual production and the standpoint of game engines and how that kind of plays in and is kind of changing the frontier of film development as well. Um, AI, I can go into any of that as if you would like to hear, know more about that. Crypto and NFTs, well, there's a section in here that we're going to talk about that has really more to do with art than it does crypto and NFTs. But again, any of these topics you want me to go into. And then the metaverse is kind of this very broad term. And I will be happy to explain you that if you want to hear about it because it gets thrown around kind of freely and sometimes used in different contexts. So we can talk about that if you would like me to talk about that, but I'm really gonna primarily focus on taking those traditional game development skills and adding them into VR and AR specific, which can play into some of these other types of emerging tech. So as I described, my background is kind of really mixed. I got a lot of stuff that I have done and did in my history. Um, and I continue to kind of just be interested in studying and learning a lot of different mediums. And I've come to find over the years that you know, when I was younger, I felt like, man, I'm just so scatterbrained. Like, I love everything and I want to do everything and I want to try this and that and that. And now as I've gotten older and wiser, <laughs> I'd like to say that I use the foundation of all of those different things that I learned every single day today. I'll use my film skills, my art background. Sometimes people are like, how do you understand so much about color theory? I'm like, oh, because I have a degree that was in art, you know? And at the time, you don't think of how these like, dominoes are going to kind of line up for you. But for me, when I think about emerging tech, it's really pulling from all these different disciplines. So if you are interested in this space, I'm telling you right now, there's probably something that you're already currently doing that applies to this space somehow. Yes. Sure. Sure. So amusement design. So theme parks, right? So I worked on a simulator and simulator is essentially it's a ride. So that you know, the thing that you go do at Dave and Buster's, even though it's sitting inside of an arcade, a family fun center, it actually is similar to a theme park ride. It's a big, huge vehicle. I have to think about safety standards. The same thing with the void. I study a lot of things that have to do with fields that you wouldn't necessarily think are related, but theme park design has a lot of stuff in there that I can already like lend from, right? So I can, I can pull up standards that they've already established within a field that's related and, and think about how are they accomplishing this? How are they executing this for a guest experience? And then I can kind of bring that back. It's also interesting when you think about um, attraction design too, from the sense of like traditional game development. I remember 
sitting inside my level design class and being like, oh, yeah, this is just like mapping out a theme park, but it's a virtual theme park, you know? And it like everything just clicked all of a sudden. And then and then the next like class session, it was like all about like, let's study Disneyland. I'm like, oh yeah, totally, because that makes sense, right? As to how a world is being built, the user flow and the journey and how you want to actually put, put that all together and design it to tell a story for our guests. So there's a lot of different things that can really be applied. And some of these more directly and obviously than others, but it's pretty shocking how many people on any given team that I've been on throughout the years, specifically emerging tech teams, have people that have specialized in all these different departments and we all come together to build something kind of unique and different, right? Oh, so my boss is a magician, legit magician, like, he is a magician. And one of the first things that he did when I showed up to, to work was a magic trick. He showed me a magic trick and then we started chatting about magic. And um, it's really fun to get to work with a magician every day. Um, and it, it's been really great just to kind of think about how illusion plays into how we perceive our experiences as, as actual consumers, right? So a lot of fun stuff there too. Yeah, exactly. Yep, you get to mess with people's perception and reality in VR. So it's really great. It's a nice little fit. Um, so as far as team leads, again, a lot of these people are going to be people that you would traditionally see in a game development studio. But with Emerging Tech, you're going to see some people that you wouldn't necessarily assume to be a part of a production team. Um, but, you know, we have people, like, I was talking about safety standards. You have to make sure that there's a safety specialist, or at least somebody who, who's recognizing that safety is something that we need to be concerned about, because we're actually dealing with physical interactions, right? I don't want you to knock out your friend next to you. I want you to play with your friend next to you. I don't want someone to get injured while they're participating in my experiences. So I need to make sure that there's certain, there's certain like, um, safety regards and like clearance and things like that, that they actually do in theme park design that I need to make sure I have some of that knowledge too as we're going in and, and designing these experiences. So I'm going to kind of go through some of the traditional rules that you would typically see in a game development studio, but I'm going to talk about, and then just briefly talk about where some of these differences come in for emerging tech. And if you guys have any questions or want me to stop on something, this is going to be high level on these. And then I'm going to go into a deep dive on some of the more design specific ones. So directing, oh, no, you're fine. Directing specifically, we talk about, you know, apparatus from a film theory perspective. Well, when you talk about apparatus from this perspective of VR, AR, it gets real interesting real fast because if I have an AR headset on, my apparatus, my window that I'm looking through might be limited. It might only be this. I designed a project for the HoloLens 2. And it's it's a really, you know, it's like really specific little narrow area. So you gotta be really like tricky with how you direct people's attention when the apparatus is so small, it's just right here. Now, when I have VR, I've got like the whole entire space to play with, right? I have a whole 360 environment that I can move things through and pull your attention in different ways. But that also means that I have a whole 360 environment where you could be looking at the wrong thing, but really not the thing that I want you to be directing your attention towards. So learning some of the tricks and trades of how to work within the medium specific that you're using is going to be very beneficial for your user experience in the end. So, you know, it's kind of different. If you can get good at this, it actually is very helpful because then you can be able to really craft that experience for someone as opposed to just hoping that somebody looks in the right direction or consumes the right content. Brands and IPs, VR projects oftentimes will align with some type of initiative that a studio has going for them which means that you might end up working on an intellectual property, which 
if you love that, which I do, <laughs> then there are certain things about that that are going to be unique, right? Different studios might have different agendas for their product, their characters, and you're going to have to learn how to work within that type of creative setting. And sometimes you're actually having to explain to a studio or an IP holder what it is you're making because they don't know what VR is yet or AR is yet or the affordances that are available to you within those spaces. So there's a lot of education that can be a part of that. And you know, learning how to like walk the fine line between explaining and getting someone excited. There's a, there's a lot of different cards that go in and are involved in that. So it's not just the creative, but there's some, some business strategy you know, kind of parts to that as well. Uh, production. Production gets really interesting within this space because you probably are working on a platform that still is kind of being developed, which means lots of R&D, right? And it's okay. Which means lots of R&D. And R&D, research and development, you would hope that it only lasts for a certain amount of time, but in production for emerging tech, it can sometimes lead all the way into almost like them a little bit before you're about to release a project, which can be very scary when you're trying to like put together a milestone. So be learning how to be flexible, learning how to say, yeah, I'm not sure exactly when that milestone is going to get hit, but this is what we're shooting for. You know, <laughs> like that, that's kind of the attitude you kind of have to start to develop because you can ask your engineers to kind of put some time boxes to what they're working on, but that doesn't necessarily become a, a fair examination on their half, right? Because they're trying to innovate a space that hasn't been created yet. They can't just Google the answer because they're probably inventing the answer as they go. Finding the talent is really difficult. So if you can get good in this space, you will probably have a job. <laughs> um, and that is because it's really hard to find people who have worked in VR, AR, some of these emerging, other emerging tech, like virtual production. If you can get good at that, like you're going to get yourself some job security because there's not a whole lot of ton of people out there that know these engines or know these processes. So it's really beneficial to to get interested in them and, and to start learning the vocabulary and, and what it is that you need to, to get into the space. Um, so engineering, like I said, R&D, you're going to be pushing boundaries. You're going to be defining boundaries. You are going to be the people who are going to make those standards, right? And because of that, there's a high demand for you as well. <laughs> so if you can get really good at understanding those game engines, engines and how to work on the different platforms, because every single one of, like, these are all VR headsets, right? All from different companies. They all have different limitations and benefits to them. And that just continues to be the climate of the space. There are headsets that might be similar to each other, but they're not exactly the same. So we are learning and developing as we go. And sometimes you're working on a product that's going to release with a headset that hasn't come out into the market yet. So it's really hard to like test some of these products. You're, there's a lot to it. So if you can become really flexible and understand your craft, it's, it's going to only be beneficial for you. So art, you know, this is kind of a hot topic of something that happened recently where Mark Zuckerberg like posted a shot, you know, selfie and horizons. And everyone's like, but that doesn't look good. <laughs> so art is going to be one of those things that's going to really push this platform forward, right? Especially for horizons. People are already kind of looking at these images and saying, wait a minute, how come it looks like that when you promised me that? If you look at the two of those, I mean, they look like night and day from each other, right? So if you can figure out how to develop, to make this art optimized for the headset that you're working on, because a lot of the standalone heads headsets right now, they're running on mobile devices. So there's so many limitations that you have there in order to get the optimization that you need. And in VR, it's really important because of latency. The latency issue is what triggers nausea and we don't want to make people sick. We're done with that. Those days are behind us. We don't make people sick anymore, right? Right, guys? 
<laughs> so in order to do that, it means we have to make sure that we're getting better and better and better at this craft. So if you're an artist that can be really good at optimizing and making beautiful pieces that really don't slow down the development process, you're going to be gold. Sound is really an interesting topic within this space too. I meet a lot of composers and sound designers that are like, I want to figure out how to get into this space because they see the value in it, right? And I don't, I don't know what it is about sound designers, but they're just like, oh, putting you in an environment where I can play with the sound all around you. It, it just fascinates them, right? And it's actually really great to know that they have that type of energy that they're bringing into the space because they're gonna come up with new practices and new ways of, of drawing the user's attention that can be so magical for a player. So this is actually a space that I give a lot of credit to because it seems like they're really trying to figure out how to maximize an, an audio immersive experience for, for a guest, which is a lot of fun. Um, and community management, like I said, we take from all over different disciplines. Community management is actually a really big deal when it comes to LBE. LBE is location-based entertainment. So when they put together community events, and this one is like an AR event, right? I don't know if anyone's played Pikmin Bloom, but this is the Niantic game on your cell phone. And it's, it's the same people that make Pokemon Go. So they have this game, and then they host these community events. And I, they, they had a community event for Pokemon Go, and it was like thousands and thousands of people showed up, right, to this one location so that they can start playing with their uh, Pokemon and, and challenge up and, and go into battles and stuff. And it's fun because you get to actually interact with the people that you're designing things for, but you're using that digital twin mapping of the world and bringing physical people together to build this community, which is a lot of fun. So I'm gonna go further into game design, but just high level, I'm gonna be talking about mechanics and physical affordances because game design specifically, it takes a lot of traditional game development, but then kind of has to shift it a little bit. So we'll get into that in more detail. User interface as well. There's some amazing things that happen with user UI develop design in this space. I will get into more detail on this as well because there's actually, I feel like UI can become one of those make it and break it scenarios. And I will explain that when we get into the next section on UI, but I'm gonna dig further into the design process on this. But just think about it from the perspective of physical interactions as well. And then narrative, we're gonna be talking about nonlinear narrative design. So again, you have a whole 360 environment, right? So when you're designing a story, you gotta figure out how to design that story appropriately. And if you're throwing in multiple users, it changes things up <laughs> quite significantly as well. Um, you're also talking about a physically immersive story, right? So I'm physically trying to get you to do something. I'm physically trying to tell you a story that's gonna require you to move potentially from space to space. So these are the design topics I'm gonna kind of dive further into. We're gonna deep dive into these, but this is also one of those spots where I was gonna take a natural break. See how natural that is? <laughs> to ask you guys if you have any specific questions about any of the stuff I already spoke about. And I know that there are some questions potentially in the chat, so we'll look at that too. But anyone here? So I'm in the UX field at DePaul. Um, I was curious, um, since UX is more of like an interdisciplinary career, yeah. um, what are the chances that um, a junior UX designer can get into the game design space with like a lack of VR, AR experience? So we need UX designers in this space. And Oftentimes I feel like you, you don't necessarily have a lot of people who have 
a huge seasoned resume when they show up because the space isn't that old, right? So, and, and UX, like people didn't give it enough credit for so many years either, right? So that you've got two things kind of working for you right there, right? Where you can, you're specialized in a subject that traditionally hasn't been given as much um, credit as it needs to because UX is really important for game design and interaction. I mean, if you can't get someone to enjoy what they're doing, then why are they doing it? You know, is kind of the philosophy. So, it, so that in, alone is already going to give you a leg up, right? But then the second part of that is there isn't a lot of people within the space that specialize in UX design. So if you can fit that niche, that's really there. Um, I've seen a lot of people that don't have a ton of like years upon years of experience in the space who actually do get hired in um, to come in as like interns or, you know, entry level positions. That's not unheard of. I've seen it happen. Um, it's just going to be a matter of you probably having to either one, seek out opportunities to work on projects to get that under your belt, specifically VR, AR stuff, or two, creating your own experiences, you know, with your friends or, or solo. I've, I've had to do the solo thing, right, on projects because nobody wanted to do it with me at the time because they're like, what's VR? I'm like, ah. <laughs> so um, you might have to do it solo, you know, a little bit. But it's only going to help you gain more confidence within the space. And having those portfolio pieces are going to help you just in general to say, like, hey, I know what I'm doing. Uh, there's also, I want to say, and message me after this talk, because I know of a online kind of like training group that kind of specializes more in the UX VR stuff. Yeah, I just, I'm like blanking on their name right this second. So just message me and I'll get you the information. But uh, that can also help you, you know, kind of at least get around the space more so you become more familiar with the language too. Yeah. Any other questions? So um, you, you talked a lot about like just kind of like the like collaboration between different fields. Um, you know, I, I've worked on a few projects where it's like that, where you kind of have like divisions of different tasks. What what is it like kind of working with people on like kind of different levels of like understanding certain projects or um, also kind of like managing that kind of like division of just like even terminology between fields like yeah, it's a great question. So um, it was briefly mentioned when when uh, my intro was given that I worked on a hyper reality television series, right? So that alone, you're like, what is that? <laughs> you know, like just me saying that, like, huh? Um, talk to game people, they don't know what I'm talking about. You talk to film people, and I don't want to talk about. So <laughs> uh, what was so nice is I felt like I was able to bring my two specialties together and kind of marry them into this nice little relationship, right? Where it's like, okay, I can talk to film people because I know your lingo. I got you. I know what you, you're looking for and what you want me to say to get you to get excited about the thing that we're talking about. But then it's like, oh, I actually know how to like run a dev team, right? A traditional game development team and specifically a VR team. So it's like, okay, yay. And I talk to you people. Uh, what ended up happening and sometimes what needs to happen and, you know, even projects that you're working on, maybe in one company that has one mission that's doing one thing, but it's emerging tech still, right? Is you start to develop a glossary for people. And um, I've spent time, sometimes hours in a room coming up with like, okay, this is what I'm going to call it. I don't really, I mean, I, I have my reasons for why I'm calling it this, but it might not be the reason that he agrees with or she agrees with, right? And then they both have different names that they want to name that same thing, right? So we get in a room we, and we just talk about it and we discuss it. And it's like, what makes sense to everyone, right? You, and that's where like the leads end up becoming kind of important because you can't have everyone in the room, right? You need those representatives who can help you collaborate and figure out like what's the best terminology for this. 
what is something that we all feel comfortable calling this weird thing that we created that doesn't have a name yet, right? Or a process that we created that doesn't have a name yet. Um, and sometimes, like, I have a coworker who just, like, he's not really into acronyms. Like, anytime you throw one at him, he's just like, ah, <laughs> you know, like, don't. Why are we calling it that, you know? <laughs> so he's like, we're going to call this one shids. And he's like, why are we calling it that, you know? And so you got to figure out the personalities on your team. Try to bring people together, align with each other, collaborate with each other, poke fun at each other, and come up with the thing that's going to work for that team. And not every team is going to look the same. And not every team is going to have the same background, right? Like the film people, I can't use game terminology with them because they're like, what? <laughs> and vice versa, the games people, like they're just not used to the film terminology. So it's like figuring out how to be that translator too is sometimes part of the role um, as a creative director is figuring out how do I align all these people with each other so that we're all speaking the same language because we're actually inventing the language as we go to sometimes. Is that helpful? You can monopolize, it's all right. <laughs> 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 I love that. You mentioned the hyper reality TV series, but what is that? <laughs> because I'm I am still yes, very confused. One hundred percent. So I can't talk about it. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh, I know. But um, just thinking about like it's taking again those two different disciplines and kind of blending them together is what I can say. Uh, I know it's one of those things. Is it released yet? No. Yeah, totally. Thanks. Thank you for understanding. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, I know. I wish I could get into more detail about that, but it's definitely, uh, it, it fits into the topic of tonight, right? Emerging tech. It's like its own kind of thing uh, that is really fun to work and create on because it's like, okay, like we're making something that no one's going to really fully understand. But that's kind of like the special part of it is like having this, you know, every project's like a, a baby. And you're like, oh, no one understands this baby, but it's okay. I know it's special and it's important to me, you know? And then somebody else like sees how how exciting it is. And hopefully everyone will get to see that someday and you guys will love my baby. So we'll see. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so my question builds a little bit on his and you you, you spent a lot of time convinced there's the need of uh, multidisciplinary teams, uh, creating a common language and all that. I'm going to throw another dimension in that is sure. the, um, how about people that are working, working sometimes remotely, sometimes in person? Have you yeah. figured it out? Yeah, figured it out. I don't know about that. Um, so I've worked on every color of team, right? Where it's like, I, I've worked on the in-person team where we were in the office every single day building something together and we're all sitting next to each other. I worked on teams where um, we were all remote, right? All of my coworkers for the most part were in Canada. Um, and here I am on my desk, you know, like, <laughs> and you, you do feel, you know, kind of isolated. Uh, and then I've worked on teams uh, right now. I work in kind of a more of a hybrid team where we are in the office some days and some days we're not. So it's kind of a back and forth thing. Um, yeah, I feel like I've worked in every type of team you can kind of think. Of. I've worked in a team where we only really worked in VR. Uh, so we were all with, always avatars hanging out with each other. And I'm really sad that we didn't have like the facial tracking stuff because it would have been nice to like get some more of that emotion across, right? But I mean, like I literally have had these most intimate, powerful moments in VR with someone that I really only knew as an avatar. So to say that there's like a human connection lost there, I don't necessarily agree with because um, I've cried in VR, you know, compassionately trying to like be there for my friend who, again, I've only ever known them as an avatar. And when I finally met them in person, like just a few months ago, after knowing them for several years, <laughs> you know, met them in person and it was like, oh wait, I know you because of your voice. That was the only way I could recognize her. Um, but so I, I do feel like there's opportunities for you to build relationships remotely or physically. 
I don't know that I have figured it out. I haven't been on a team where it was like, yeah, this is the magical way to get it done because I feel like every team is different. Every project is different. Different platforms. Oh, yes. Different platforms require different things as well, right? So there are at-home games that I've worked on where we all worked remotely from home, but we could because it was an at-home game, right? And it's like, we don't physically have to be with this like massive electronic simulator that we're all building for. Um, and that one was interesting because that was actually built during the pandemic. So it was like, how are we gonna, uh, gotta figure this out. And we we did some workarounds to figure that out. Uh, but we, luckily there was a day with Mustard in Salt Lake too. So that was great. Um, but yeah, I don't know that there's one way to do it because it feels like, you know, we would, and that's part of the like being malleable thing. Um, especially like hopefully if there's any producers in here, like try to be malleable with your people, especially during the pandemic, you know, post pandemic, everyone's got a different way of kind of what they would expect from work these days. Right. Um, but try a process out. And if it doesn't work for that team, then clearly you got to try something else out. Right. Don't keep forcing people to do it one way because you're not gonna get the best work out of them is what I've come to realize. So yeah, I wish I had a clear cut answer for you. I do feel like if you're building at home VR or AR for that matter, um, you, can re you, you can do that from home pretty easily, um, but utilize some of those, those social VR opportunities, right? Like we would go and play games in VR because it's like, we all know we have headsets because everyone's got a headset on the team. So let's go do something that brings us together as well. So any other questions? From the chat, uh, what is a recommended portfolio when approaching narrative in VR? Since it's such a newer, such a, since it's such a new medium, what are the selling points of story when it seems like many companies are focused on the immediate immersive experience. Great question. Um, I'm going to dive further into narrative design in this next section. It's one of the bullet points I said. Um, so I'll dive further into that. Uh, you'll probably get a sampling of that through the slide that I put up to kind of give you a reference. And, and we'll kind of go into that a little bit further. So if there's additional questions to that, question. I personally have a, a question for you about, it, have you seen a pattern? Could you maybe qualify the type of people who might be more likely to connect to the avatar or have those emotional experiences that you, like, I am convinced that you have had them. I have had them. I don't know if this is something that every person can actually experience or if it's some kind of trait or something about your lived experience that on through that makes you more likely. I mean, that's a good question. Um, I don't, I don't know that it's necessarily like one type of characteristic because I'm always kind of surprised, right? Like I have made stuff in different types of formats, and sometimes people connect to this one more than they do to that one, right? So, and, and I think it's also partly the content, right? So it's, are they, con are they resonating with? the story? Are they resonating with a character or the world or the, ex or the type of experience, right? Is it, is it because this is like a co-op play opportunity? Um, so I actually have a friend in the audience who <laughs> lives here, which is great. Um, we met because we were both fellows at a conference that was specifically for film. It was a film conference. And I was like the weirdo who did like VR, right? But I, I also had my film background as well, right? So that's why I was at this conference, why I was a fellow. It was a great experience, I loved the whole time. Obviously made some great friends. We have another mutual friend who was also a fellow of this conference who, um, there was a group of us and we happened to be in uh, Minnesota. We were in Minnesota. And Mall of America is there. And we had just opened a location in Mall of America for the void. This is pre-pandemic. 
So we opened the location in, in Mall of America. And I was like, guys, you guys got to come with me to go secret shop this like new location. Flash, like, I'll get you guys all in for free. We can go do a VR experience together. It's going to be great. I promise. And one of our friends was like, man, he's kind of like gruffy, but he, you know, he's a friend. So he came with all of us because it's like free VR. Why, why, why not? Right. So like he comes and he's like not into VR really, but not really his, his thing. Not really into games that much either. And we go and, and we do the secrets of the empire, which is a Star Wars experience. And, um, you know, he goes in and he's, whatever. We kind of got split up just because like the number of people in our group. So I wasn't with him as they went through, but they went through before me. Or was it after me? I can't remember. Anyways, they go through, I go through, we both come out and he is like sweaty. Like, like his shirt is soaked. Like it is sweat and his face is red. And, And I'm just like, whoa, what happened to you? He's like, that was amazing. That like blew my mind. I was on the floor. I was a stormtrooper. I was trying to get him. And he, he got so into it that it completely like shifted his perspective on this medium and what it could afford him as a player, right? And he he liked Star Wars. I mean, he knew the franchise, but he wasn't like obsessed with Star Wars. But it really gave him an opportunity to engage with the content and feel like he was a stormtrooper fighting against Darth Vader, and it completely shifted the way that he saw the medium. And the next time I saw him, he was actually working on a VR project, which was really cool, you know? So I've seen it inspire people to really want to engage with this space, have these emotional experiences. For him, it's not like he came out crying because he saw Spider-Man, which I've seen that happen. Um, But he had a moment. And I think that's the cool part of this medium is that we're trying to create and craft magical experiences for people. And you get to see that happen. You get to see the impact it has on how people consume this content and how people socially engage with each other. And I'll explain more about that as well um, as I go through this. Any other questions? Good. Okay. All right. We will continue on. So these are the topics I'm going to be going over. I'm going to deep dive a little bit further into some of these design specific topics because I know we got designers in the room. Yay. Okay. So gameplay design. Gameplay design becomes very interesting within this space. The reason for that is you still take a lot of the traditional game philosophy but now we're applying it to your body or to a physical experience or interaction that I need you to do, which really kind of starts to shift how you think about mechanics and the physical opportunities that this medium is going to afford you, right? So if you saw in Avengers, you're doing this, right? You're shooting, you're using your hands. Hand tracking has always been super important to us at the Void, right? Because it's a, it's a natural way to interact. You don't have to t- teach people how to do a fist or physical movements because we do that every day. It's a lot easier than a controller to teach someone, someone how to do a motion, especially if, if you're like showing them, you're demonstrating it, and then you're expecting them to do it. So the physicality becomes really, really interesting within this space as far as how you can develop some of those game rules and those interactions. Um, It's also interesting because you're asking people to physically do an action, which might require them to like lean down and bend down. So you have to think about how you're designing that motion for people as well, right? Their movement through that space. Because I don't want you to smash into a wall when you do that. So I need to be really mindful of how your body is gonna physically move through that space. And also, it's not just you typically, right? You might have several other people with you in your party. So I want to make sure that when you go to hit something like an enemy, you're not actually going to whack your friend in the head either. So a lot of different types of considerations that are being taken when you're developing these like game rules and structures as well. 
And then haptic design is a part of this too, because people are going to be shooting at you potentially. So you want to feel that, right? You want to feel that haptic um, from, it's a haptic input that not only serves as an indication that, oh, I've been hit, but that haptic input actually helps you with some of the disconnection that can happen that causes the nausea for people. So if you get an input, it actually helps you regain uh, your, your, your kind of structure within space. So it helps you understand a physical and a virtual connection, which can actually help eliminate some of the motion sickness as well. And then as far as gating is concerned, when we're talking about throughput or moving people through space, you kind of need to pace them as they're going through a space, right? It's almost like, um, have you guys ever been to a haunted house before? So they do a lot of design to, to kind of pace the flow of people. So that's why you're, you like stand there and you wait for your turn. The other people go ahead of you and you're kind of like, oh, I wish I was behind them because then they'll get freaked out and I won't get freaked out, right? And you kind of want to use them as a shield or something, but they intentionally pace you out because they need that buffer or space. So it's kind of the same thing. Like we need to pace you out so that you don't run into each other because you're literally blindfolded. <laughs> so you don't want people to hit each other. Oops, wrong way. Narrative design. So going to the question that came up. So these are some examples of scripts that um, we've kind of worked on. And there's different ways of kind of laying things out. So when you're talking about 360 environment, sometimes you have to like split it up and say, okay, I want people to look in this direction. Well, what is that direction? And that's where like the quadrants kind of come in. So you can start to separate them out. The reason why they get like color coded too is because then you can actually write that section of the script in that color. You know that's happening here. You know that's happening in this other quadrant because it's color coded, right, essentially. So that's one way. Now I'm gonna tell you, there is no one way to write a narrative design script in this space. They can look completely different from each other. I've seen them done literally in PowerPoint before. <laughs> and, uh, and it worked, right? It, worked, it works. It depends on the team. Again, you have to be malleable. You have to figure out like what is going to serve this team the best and then start to build from there. And it's really hard if you're like stuck in your one way which tends to happen, you know, we're all human. We get set in our ways. But if you get stuck in your one way and it's actually not giving the other person on the team what they need, then you're going to have to figure out how to help them get what they need, right? Because you need to start aligning with each other in order to craft the right type of experience. So it could look like this. It could look completely different. You know, it really can change. Sometimes you might have to create lines that really force someone to move. Like I physically need you now at this point in the experience to move over there or you're gonna break up my flow. I need you to physically move over there, which means that I might have to make a push line to get you to go, right? So it's starting to think about how that narrative can play into the user experience in the physicality as well, right? So there's different ways of using this. With Jumanji, we actually use internal lines to push people, but also give flavor. So we actually had the cast from Jumanji record those lines. And it was really fun because you got to hear the rock. If you were the rock, and sometimes I would purposely try to be the rock, so I was like a teeny tiny little rock walking around the stage, right? Which was fun. Um, I would actually hear uh, his voice. So Bravestone, the character, played by the rock, I actually got to hear his voice. So it, it helps you like feel more immersed into that space as well. But then I could also use that beneficially to get you to do the things I need you to do because you didn't do the thing I need you to do so you can move forward, right? So there's, there's like tricks that you can use. So the scripts aren't going to always look the same, but you should definitely review traditional script writing methods, right? So a lot of the people I've worked with and including myself, right? I come from a traditional film background. So writing traditional film scripts. 
and then starting to develop like my own way of trying to figure out how to do it. And, and that might change, right? Like this script over here, if you see like, it's like branching narrative opportunity. Okay, well, that's more of a game reference, right? Like that's gonna be something that probably a game person is gonna understand a little bit more than a film person. So it still kind of looks like a traditional script, but it's, it's not in the sense that like, there's something going on there that somebody might not necessarily know from the film background. And then I think I have, or maybe somewhere in the script, I don't know if it's on there, but um, there's moments where I talk about like, and now the simulator is gonna be doing this thing, right? So you have a, a reference as to what's going on in the physical world. So there's you know, different realities that are happening there and you're kind of having to describe them simultaneously sometimes with each other. Um, So, oh wait, should I wait though? Does the person in the chat, did that help? Person in the chat, did that help? Do you have more questions? Here's a direct message. Okay, if you have more questions, you let me know. You have a question though. Yeah. Um. So, I have a question about the narrative that you mentioned um, yeah. for a person that, um, so I have a um, like film background, but more in the independent cinema. Sure. Yeah. I was wondering what is um, the future of this narrative or any kind of side narrative for those people that are not really interested in the, the Marvel's kind of um, superheroes or really kind of think about the art of the kind of entertainment more than kind of the industrial aspect of that. Uh, what could be the possibilities of what is the avenues that we have right now? The other things is how inclusive is this environment? So um, for me, myself, or I, I have like super kind of um, the situation that I cannot play the game because I have a motion sickness and I have a migraine. So when I have these two both, it's kind of yeah. super, super, super hard to, uh, I'm really interested, but I cannot experience that. Um, so what is the kind of possibility to make the this environment more accessible for people like me? So there's lots of work. First, first of all, like I completely understand because I, since I have worked in this space for so long, I've met many people who, um, I have a good friend who was like, I really want to do some of your work. And he never got to go to the void for you know, specific circumstances. He like, lived in a different state and stuff like that. But he really wanted to go to the void. And I kept trying to tell him, like, I promise you it's going to be a different experience for you. Because he had tried some VR, but some of the early VR was just really bad. I'm just going to say it. Like, it was bad. It made me sick. I've been sick before where it's put me out for, like, days. Where I'm, like, in bed, headache, nauseated, cannot do anything for, like, solid weekend. Like, did it on a Friday afternoon, was out the whole weekend, right? Um, but that's because it was really bad VR. You know, it, it, it wasn't designed correctly, and it wasn't engineered correctly. So, again, going back to if you can get good at this, mm, there's a need for you, right? Um, so I do know that there's lots of people that do have cer certain circumstances that cause the nausea. They're doing a lot of work with haptics. Like I was saying before, like haptics can actually make quite a significant like difference for um, the misconnection between. So what's happening is like your visuals and your physical are not matching up and your body is like fight or flight mode. You are sick. You are a primal animal who ate a bad berry. Go throw up. You know, that's literally what's happening. <laughs> it's like literally the scenario that's happening because your, your like vision is different than your body. Right. So it's like, Oh, you must be poisoned. Um, so that's why you throw up the haptics actually helps offset that. So there are headsets that are currently being developed and are supposed to you know, come out into the field. I, I believe it's the PlayStation version two of the headset that like literally just got announced finally that it's going to be like in the market soon has like special haptics that are built into the headset itself. So it's like the, there's haptics here, there's haptics in the controllers and all of that input is going to help you. Now our, at the void, 
we really take this into consideration because as you saw, some of our partners are these massive studios. And I can tell you, Disney does not want you sick ever. <laughs> that, is, that is not on the agenda for them, right? So what that means is we've crafted a lot of ways to be able to combat that that sickness that gets kind of triggered for people. Um, and that, you know, if you saw that haptic vest, that's like another input, sensory input for you. There's other things that we do in the environment to offset it. Another thing that helps can be fans as well. And so there are some headsets that have built-in fans too. Um, if you, it's like the orientation, the proprioception of your body, essentially. So the orientation, if it knows like it's always pointed in the right direction and you feel that input, that wind input from an exterior source, then it knows that it's coming from the right direction. So there's a lot of things that can be done to kind of trick your brain into saying, this is reality, it's not fake. Um, don't stay away from some of the bad stuff, you know? <laughs> stay away from some of the at-home experiences. I would try things like what we do at the Boyd because it, it might be a better opportunity for you than some of the stuff that you've been exposed to. Um, but yeah, I, I've heard of that before. And the second part or the first part of your question as far as like, is there is there growth in this space? Can you do indie stuff, right? Um, my first exposure to VR was at a film festival. So it was Sundance. Sundance, independent film festival, okay? That was my first like true exposure. It was the first year they actually had VR at the festival. And um, it blew my mind. And it wasn't, it wasn't a big studio IP or anything like that. It was just, it was a very simple but impactful piece for me. And it showed me the possibilities of the medium. And it wasn't even really using all of the 360 environment, right? But I I could see like, oh, this is this is what I've been waiting for. This is like all of the things I love all rolled into one little headset. Hey, here it is. Um, so, no, it's, it's a, I'll, t I'll tell you, because it's kind of, it's a really heavy subject. So it can be triggering the subject. So I will tell you later. Um, but South by Southwest is another film, primarily film festival. Uh, they have a VR, AR section of the prop the programming as well. Um, and there's, the list goes on, right, of all of the different film festivals that typically have indie film at their festival who are doing VR. I mean, there's like Toronto, I believe, has like an, a VR AR section, uh, Hot Docs as well, they have one too. So it's not just big studios working in that space, it's also a lot of indie, um, Kind of projects being made and i you know my, my first first project was a 360 film and it didn't it didn't have the interaction which is why i was like i'm gonna figure this out and i'm gonna hardcore go study this and figure out how to do it because i wanted to do more of the interaction myself um but you know 360 filmmaking it's it's traditional filmmaking in a lot of ways right i was able to use a lot of my traditional filmmaking stuff and then be like oh, hey, you can actually see the light in the shot. Like, mm, how are you going to hide that now? You know, like, so you had to get creative at the beginning, you know, when people are still figuring it out. Um, but it was a lot of, you know, blocking the scene, a lot of theater kind of principles going into how you block a scene correctly. Um, so the space is still developing, growing, and it's up to you kind of what you want to do. Like, what's your passion? If it's three... If it's 360 filmmaking, there's so much like space and growth for that. There's people that do it. That's what they make their whole living off of. I know them. They're you know, that, their whole studio. That's all they do is 360 filmmaking. And then there's the you know kind of game development, 3D environment stuff with the interactive stuff, which is you know, more of the stuff that I do currently. Um, it's just kind of whatever you want to do. You know, but it doesn't have to all be big studio IP stuff. Any other questions? No? Okay. Oh, wait. Okay. So mission mission design. Like I was telling you, 
I got really sick once and it put me out for a whole weekend. And it was because of this using the, the locomotion of the game was the only way that you could get around in this one experience. And the way that the mission was designed was that you had to jump, 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 jump to get through these spaces. And jumping in VR with locomotion and not being able to actually just teleport over to a certain location, for me, after doing it for so many minutes, I was like, oh gosh, <laughs> like I am so sick right now. And you had to like jump, 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 get this thing, then jump, 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 jump back to take the thing to the thing to this other place so that you could unlock the gate to get the, to the next part. And then that next part, you had to jump, 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 jump again. So realizing like the type of systems and movement that you're asking people to do is actually, it can be detrimental for someone, right? It could literally put them out and make it a really bad experience. Um, and it's hard, you know, like sometimes I'll, test things for people and I'm like, oh, this is actually making me very sick. So people are still doing it because maybe it's their game and they've been working on it for so long that they're just like used to it, right? They're used to that type of movement through the space. But if if you are not, or if I'm going to open this up to a broader audience, I need to have every single type of person testing this so that I know for sure that people can actually use it. Um, and then also like primary demographics can also play a part into that. So if you're designing a game that you know specifically you want a female audience to play it, females, unfortunately, like we get more motion sickness <laughs> than males do, which is, it's interesting because statistically it says that, but most of my friends I know that get it are actually men. So I don't know. I believe it, but I don't at the same time. But knowing your demographic of like, if your primary demographic is somebody who is going to get sick, then, then you've got to design in a way so that you can limit that as much as possible, right? Certain types of interactions or bringing things to players, whatever it is that you're going to do, um, just take that into consideration as you're designing. Level design. Oh my gosh. Your city, Chicago, this place is cool. And part of the reason why it's so cool it's because of all of the buildings in the city. And you guys knew that. I didn't know that when I got here. I was like, oh my gosh, like this place is amazing. You, and I went on like the tour of like all the buildings and all the history. And I went to like go look at the little models. I'm like, this is a white box. That's what this is. Like this is literally a white box of the city, right? And in game development, you're doing white boxes of cities. So level design, if you're a level designer, if you're interested in level design, this city is gonna have so much to offer as far as like education, references, understanding space, how people move through space. Like you have tons of resources here. That's amazing. Because, you know, you think about it, I was like reading some of the facts and things about like, okay, why don't they do some of these methods anymore for building the buildings? And it's because, oh, well, it's not eco safe and it's not efficient and all this kind of stuff. Well, in game design, it doesn't matter, right? You don't have to worry about that stuff. So you can like make crazy looking buildings that can do all sorts of stuff and give people experiences that are unique that they might not be able to have in the reality. So it's really kind of fun to see how the city's laid out and how these buildings really play a story for the city as well. And that's what you're doing, right? As a level designer. Um, one of the people that I went to grad school with, his he had a whole career first as an architect. And I was always like, oh man, you just understand space so well. Like you get it. And he did. He understood how like physical spaces can tell stories and flows of spaces can tell stories. Now in VR and especially like what we do at the void, the one-to-one -one ratio, it's like, I need to know that you can comfortably move through this space, right? So I'm asking you to literally walk over here and I don't want anything to clip into your head. And I want the proportions to be correct. So actually understanding some of that design principle can play into the type of experience that you have. So really fun stuff. And you guys have a lot of information just at your fingertips here, which is really cool. Um, and also like we do what is called redirection in at the void as well. And what that means is I basically am taking you know, taking a space, a physical space that's only so big, but I'm making it so much bigger virtually 
So getting you to move through the space in a way that where you don't realize that you've already been through that section already, but it it's com it feels completely new. And people all the time, even some of my coworkers, it's like, I'm lost right now. I don't know where I'm where I am. You know, they they're trying to like, you're trying to like pay attention in your mind, like, okay, no, I know that the wall's here. Because like, we know, right? Because we work on the stage, we all, we're always there. But sometimes you can get people lost. And it's fun when you can get somebody lost who's been working on the stage for years. <laughs> so it, VR really can do that. It can trick somebody into um, believing that they're somewhere else, which is fun. And how you play with that skill, right? So you're able to make things so much bigger than they would be in real life. But it's because maybe that character in the IP is bigger and is supposed to be bigger. And you want to feel that they're scary because that's how big they are. They're huge, right? So it was really fun also like when I was working on the Transformers piece because it's like VR scale, Optimus Prime, like you got this massive robot, you know? But everyone just like loves so much. It's like, but if, if you designed it so that they only saw his, you know, his knees or whatever, <laughs> That's a boring experience, right? So eventually, you want to make sure that they can get that full scale of how large he is. And him with Megatron was actually, it was really fun um, to design that out. So 2D and 3D UI design is actually really important when it comes to this space. Because, in, and when you're, when you're thinking about AR, it becomes really interesting as well because in AR, you know, you have you you can be a traditional 2D artist, and a lot of those skills are going to directly translate straight over, right? In VR, they translate over as well because I need you to know how to interact with this panel. So having that design principle of 2D and how to create those interfaces, it directly translates over, and I need you to physically do something too. So knowing how a 2D or 3D object looks within space, how big it needs to be, how legible it needs to be. So different font types are going to really play into how somebody's going to interact with this content, right? It's It seems so simple in your mind. But then when you put it into VR, it can look so bad. <laughs> and it actually is really hard to read in VR because of the resolution, right? So and also because when, when you are in a virtual space, all of a sudden you stop hearing and reading. I don't know what it is, but you just kind of stop, you forget how to do those two things sometimes. And so um, to rely on the fact that someone's gonna read something, it's, you, you know, you're kind of being foolish a little bit to rely on the fact that they're actually gonna just hear that push line that you sent to them when they're like in awe of this like beautiful world that you just put them in, like that's not fair too, right? So it's like layering and combining a lot of these design principles together so that somebody has a fair chance at being able to be a winner in your space. Cause that's what you want, right? You want them to have a good experience while they're there. So all of these traditional principles are super important when you put them in the context of these immersive spaces. Um, and also, you know, color. We use color to kind of direct people to look in a certain area sometimes, right? It's the same thing when you think about traditional game levels, right? You, you know that certain ledges, if they have this one type of material on them, they're climbable. You can grab onto them and you can traverse them. And, you know, you know that because you, you learned that throughout the level, right? And it keeps coming up. So you can use some of those traditional principles, but now you gotta think about them from a physical space, right? And then you gotta think about them as how can I use this source of light to direct you from looking over here to now you're looking over here because that's where I need you to look now, not over there anymore. So it's learning how to use some of these traditional skills in a new way that's more physical too. Um, and then, you know, as far as gameplay is concerned and graphic design, these are cards that we give to people while they're standing in line or waiting or queuing. This is part of their first part of the experience. And I mean, this is traditional, you know, graphic design, but it's actually giving you all your mechanics too. And it's giving you the rules. It's giving you tips on how you're going to win, 
like you have different lives on there's like tattoos on your arm in Jumanji and you lose a life um you your tattoo starts to dissolve away because your lives are dissolving away so uh we we teach that to you using these you know traditional methods and then it becomes a souvenir you take it home and it's kind of fun um system designs i don't know if you guys played pokemon go very much there's all sorts of warnings all over it now, right? They didn't used to be there. If you were like an early adopter, they weren't there before. Pokemon Go, um, oh no, Pikmin, Bloom, straight out of the box, like already like immediately was like, hey, do not drive while you're playing this game. It tells you, right, constantly. Because there are so many people getting into accidents, right? So like, this is like really important. If you develop a system that requires a person to do, to do a certain action, you're putting their safety on the line, you got to start thinking about the ethics of that too, right? So it's how are you developing these systems? How are people going to interact with them in the real world? Are they going to be driving while they're doing it? Hopefully not, but I mean, unfortunately they did, right? And people do. Um, so how do you design the systems to create opportunities for people and keep them safe at the same time is kind of part of that question, right? And also, you know, the, the real world behavior, you're, desi you're designing these systems in a way where you want people to actually get together, right? These kind of communal designs where you have co-op play, like I, I want you to meet a friend when you get to that certain location. That's like the goal, right? I want you to meet that person. So I have to make sure that I design the thing properly. For you. Um, UX design, we kind of spoke a little bit about this, but you know, thinking about the physical abilities of people while you're creating experiences is actually really important, right? We want to accommodate everyone to everyone to have a good experience. So does this actually make sense? Do people actually know what you're trying to get them to do? So UX becomes really important in that because we want to make sure that they're having a good experience. That and and it's also it's part of the business model, right? Like if someone physically is stuck here and they are physically standing right there, it screws up my flow too, right? So there's, there's a business to this, right? So you need that person to physically move along, which means I need to clearly explain what you need to do in this moment so I can move you along for the next people to come through, which also plays into some of the psychology of this as well. How are people gonna physically interact with this thing? If I make something that looks like a hole in a gate and it was just for artistic purposes, but now they're trying to go through this hole and they're smashing into a wall, that's not a good user experience, right? So you have to think about how you're designing some of these spaces and what people's behaviors are gonna be. Um, sensory design, kind of talked about this already, but we have lots of sensory kind of inputs. Okay, um, we have a lot of sensory inputs at the void. And so you get heat, you get wind, you get that haptic feedback. So when you are in Mustafar, you actually can smell what it would smell like to be in Mustafar. You feel the heat of Mustafar. So it's really fun to kind of play with people's senses and, and give them an opportunity to, to feel like they're immersed in that space. So really quickly, I'm gonna run through these slides super fast, but I just wanted you guys to be somewhat familiar with the UX production pipeline. Um, and what that is, is basically, it's the same as a traditional production pipeline for uh, game development, but there are some like differences that kind of come up within this. So many kind of use transformers as like some of the images on the side, you'll see that in correlation to these. So, you know, concept wise, there's a lot of different things kind of happening during this, this time, but one of the biggest things is we're trying to form our partnership, we might have to figure out our platform that we're using. Um, on this project, you can see there's a big simulator. Uh, there's a vibe. You have to learn both of these platforms, what you can and can't do on them before you can even really get into any of the project, right? And you also have to figure out your IP. What does that studio want? What are they interested in? So there's a lot of kind of conversations happening, but sometimes it's also training the studio as to what we can and can't do within that particular platform. Pre-production, so again, we've talked about a lot of these things, but 
this is where we start to really kind of develop the project, right? And put some of these pieces together. We're thinking about that 360 environment as we're creating the narrative and we're going through all the different stages of the project. So and research and development is happening this whole time, right? Engineering Engineers are trying to figure out a bunch of stuff as this is going. And production, here we are, you know, we're still working on all these things, but safety, we're testing out some of the things that we're, we've been trying and putting together. And we need to make sure that people don't get hurt, right? And that becomes a really big part of the QA sessions and testing and making sure that we're going to put something out into the field that best represents every party involved. And then you release, right? Here we are, we're releasing. And this is exciting. And this is maybe where you have your community events. And you start to get people excited about your project and they become engaged and they start talking about things and you, know, you start wrapping up like marketing stuff. Um, and sometimes you have to figure out those health requirements. We live in an age post COVID. So there's a lot of different health requirements now that people you know, will ask you about as they're going through your experience. And that's part of all of this, right? And post-production, again, Looking at that safety, we're constantly checking to make sure because now we've got more throughput. We get more people testing this in different locations with different cultures and different behaviors. How are they interacting with things? You have to make sure that they're okay. And we have all our operations teams for us at the void or like at Dave and Buster's as well. You have specific people you have to train on how to run the thing, right? And you've been doing that throughout it, but you might have to start tweaking that depending on the location specific as well. So really quickly, we're going to talk about you and what that means as far as how to be successful in this field, traits. Um, be flexible. If you haven't picked that up by now, you're, not everything is going to go as smoothly as you wish it would. It's just not. So try to be flexible. Try not to feel defeated when something doesn't work because it's probably not going to work. Have a curious personality. You go out there, try things, test it, and be okay at failing because it's it might not work, but that doesn't mean that it's not a good idea. You might just have to try it a different way or bring another type of person onto the team to help you, right? But being that problem solver really becomes an asset to a team. Having the attitude that, okay, well, let's figure out how to fix it or solve it or come up with a new solution, right? You might have to be the person to define standards, and which means that you have to be okay with not finding them on the internet um, and reaching out to other people that might have that information. If, you're, if you like IPs, that's your thing. There's a lot of transmedia in this space. Sometimes the projects that are coming out of this space come from like a marketing uh, budget. So if this is the thing that gets you excited, Lots of stuff happening here, happening. Alignment's super important, right? Because you have so many different disciplines and so many different people, different languages and all sorts of things happening. So you gotta kind of work together, right? You have to figure out how to align with each other and have those hard conversations. Uh, teamwork is super important. Try to learn everyone's roles. I know that's really hard, but try to learn their roles. Try to learn what they do. Try to become friends with the people that are not even in your department because they might have an answer to the problem that you're trying to solve. So try to get to know everyone, know who your audience is when you're talking to them, right? Know your field, seek out the resources, find the books, get as much information as you can, get involved in different networks. There's so much information out there, right? And even if there's not someone doing the thing you want to do in your city, that doesn't mean that there isn't someone doing the thing you want to do in a different city or a different state that you can try to connect with through some of these virtual platforms, right? So it's kind of fun. You can meet people from all over the world who are doing the things that you want to do. If you've never been in a game engine, jump into one. <laughs> There's so many free resources online. Unity and Unreal have so much information just out in the world. And the communities are really strong and people really want to engage with you. So. I think we're out of time for questions because <laughs> we did them all throughout. But it was lovely to be here with you today. And if you guys have questions for me later, please feel free. If you have a question right now, can we take the question right now? 
Okay, one question. Hello. So, um, well, VR invites privacy. Um, example, I read an article that says hackers can, you know, break into VR and steal facial expressions, stuff like that. Will that be a big problem in the future? Oh, that's such a huge question. Um, and I wish I had the answer for you because, you know, right now, I mean, there's data concerns all over the place, right? With everything that we kind of agree, we agree to the terms and we submit and like, you know, Apple's got every bit of my information. They know everything about me. Um, but I guess in regards to this particular space, it's interesting to think about like, who is the governing body? Because if we're building a metaverse, who's the governing body of that, right? And if it's one governing body that has one type of culture, that doesn't necessarily mean it fits the culture of everyone in the world. So these are questions I'm constantly asking myself. I don't know the answers to them. Um, I know that most lawyers are trying to reference either, you know, internet interactions or the physical world that we live in. But it's it's a good concern. It's a good question. I wish I had an answer for you. I'm curious to figure out what it's going to look like to you. Think blockchain. Thanks. Oh, blockchain. <laughs> oh, geez. Um, yeah, I guess that's, uh, you know, on that note, like, if you take a job with a company, I you know a lot of people are just kind of starting off and starting into the field, uh, reference the company, figure out who they are, figure out what their agenda is. There's so much fraud that can, like there's opportunities for fraud in any space. If it's a new company and you don't know who they are, try to figure out who they are, right? Because again, they need you probably just as much as you need them. Um, and you want to get yourself aligned with somebody that you agree with. So be careful. There is fraud in every space. Sometimes, you know, when there's a big flow of money coming through a space, this is one of those spaces right now, but big influx of money, uh, there tends to be people that chase it who are not necessarily always the best players in the field. So just be careful. If you guys have any questions, you want to reach out to me, connect with me, LinkedIn, Twitter. It's lovely to be here with you tonight. Thank you.